One aspect of the seniorial system that I find when I'm trying to explain this to my students is that it's very difficult for students to understand what the seniorial system is. They tend to, uh, because they have a mindset uh, of our freehold system in their, in their minds, they tend to think that that's the only way property could ever be held. So you're either a property owner or you're a renter. Uh, you're renting your apartment or whatever from you know, the, the landlord. Under the seigneurial system, it's a completely different way of looking at property. Uh, it's essentially, the only person who owns the property, and I'm thinking back to the origins of it in New France, is the king of France. And then he uh, grants of tracts of land, which we can call, which were called seigneuries, to seigneurs uh, in return for, uh, it's kind of feudal, but in, in return for an oath of loyalty and a, and a very nominal annual rent. Uh, and uh, provided that they introduce uh, settlers to the land. This was supposed to be an obligation, although it was never enforced. Um, and these settlers are called sans terre because they pay sans a rent. And these rents uh, originally are quite low because there's lots of land and very few people, so seniors competing against each other to bring these sans terres in. Anyway, as a sans terre, you're not a tenant because you, once you've agreed to the annual sans rent that you're going to pay, that cannot be changed. And that does not change even with your, the next generation or your heirs or your heirs' heirs. It's a fixed rent. So there's a lot of stability there. You're allowed to mortgage the land as the sans terre. You're allowed to sell it, although you pay a tax if you do to the seigneur. But the seigneur pays a tax to the king if he sells his seigneury. Uh, so the, the, this, these taxes are kind of onerous, but they were designed to uh, keep people attached to the land too, because stability was considered important for a, a, a paternalistic society. Um, so in many ways, the seigneurial system, you could say, benefited the average farmer or habitant, as they were known in Lower Canada, because unlike the English system where speculators, absentee proprietors, who had a lot of money, could invest in it, tie it up, and not sell it, or once it became, once people were desperate for land, charge very high rates, that didn't happen in the seigneurial system. So that's one of the reasons why the Patriot, for example, in the early 19th century, argue that they want to hang on to the seigneurial system. It's not only because of the nationalist reasons that this is somehow distinctively French-Canadian in North America, but also that the uh, freehold, British freehold system pushes people off the land, uh, makes it very difficult for people to get onto the land. And of course, the French-Canadian population, um, mostly after the rebellion, but even before it's becoming overcrowded, in the 1840s, what you see is thousands of people beginning to migrate from Lower Canada to New England to work in the, well, actually textile mills in the 1860s, but even before that they are moving into the United States to get land because there's just none left. Um, so that idea of keeping people in Lower Canada, keeping them on the land is a very important reason why the reformers in Lower Canada did not want to, uh, to abolish the seigneurial system. Why did, the British would have liked to have many of them because they wanted to be able to speculate and, and invest in it. But many British bought seigneuries, and partly for investment purposes, but also partly for prestige purposes. Uh, because, of course, to be uh, uh, a p part of the gentry, you had to be landed. So you made a lot of money on the fur trade or on the lumber trade, then you buy a seigneury. Uh, that gives you more status. So there wasn't a lot of push to abolish the seigneurial system from the British side either. Um, why does it eventually get abolished? Uh, well, I talked earlier, first of all, with Alan Greer's work and how some of the more radical patriots were in favor of abolishing it. But uh, that comes out more in the 1838 rebellion, which had no hope of succeeding because uh, the British military was so strong. Papineau had already fled and so on. So it was kind of a last ditch radical effort. Um, but uh, there's moves, just as I talked in the 1840s, towards you know, education reform, municipal reform. Hand in hand with that is uh, seigneurial reform. And so some people wanted to, because some of the seniors were charging larger rents, you couldn't increase the rent once land was granted. But land that wasn't granted, they could, you know, uh, demand a higher sans rent, and that would hope that would 
discourage people from moving onto the land. And they also could start in, uh, intro they also started introducing all sorts of other more onerous things like um, taking some of the fish or trying to that were caught, preventing the senior senior would monopolize the mill sites, for example, so that only he, well, under the senior system, only the senior uh, could own a, a flour mill and everybody had to take their flour there. But the seniory I looked at, they also monopolized the sawmill sites and uh, because of the water power they could control and uh, anything to do with mining and so on. Once you move into the 1840s and 50s and you're beginning to have industrialization, railway construction, um, the seigneurial system is seen as an impediment because the senior, in order to push a railway through a seigneury, uh, you would have to uh, you know, deal with the senior, and uh, and so it was seen as, and of course the senior, because of his control of the mill sites and so on, might be able to hold back economic development. He might not have enough capital to develop these places. So it's all part and parcel of a change towards a more uh, industrializing impetus uh, and uh, urbanizing, I suppose. Um, and it, Apart from that, I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to put one's finger on, on, on why then, except that it was seen as completely anachronistic, you know, by the 1850s. And uh, just a matter of time because everywhere else, of course, uh, didn't have it and it was seen as futile and backward in a way. Um, but um, what's interesting is that many, many historians in Lower Canada have looked at the seigneuries as a result partly of that debate around the rebellions that Fernand Ouellette was pivotal in, looking at uh, the degree to which uh, people in rural seigneuries were becoming impoverished or not, or progress was being made or not. Uh, very few looked at what happened once seigneurial system was abolished. So those local studies are very good for the pre-1854 period. There are very few for the post-1854 period. And, and that's why I decided to work on Jolie de Laubinière, one of the reasons who was a senior, seventh generation senior. And uh, to see the extent to, or the, what, what influence at the local level the uh, abolition of the seigneurial system uh, caused. And in fact, abolition is even too strong a word because you could call it, I think, commutation is a word that's used. Because the seniors continue after 1854 to be able to uh, collect rents uh, from the people who were uh, pr previously uh, paying sans rent. Now it's called constituted rent. Um, and um, more importantly, I think, particularly for Lobinier, is that under the seigneurial system, if someone came to you and said they wanted land, some of your un, some of what we call wild land, land that hadn't been cultivated or, or, or granted yet, the senior was obliged to provide it for him. Uh, he couldn't hold it back, unlike the freehold system. Well, what happens once seigneurial system is abolished? Let's say, well, the land that hadn't been settled yet remains in the hands of the senior which means that he can do with it as he wishes. He can uh, grant it or not. And so in a way, they gain more power over the land within their seigneury, particularly those seigneurs who had seigneuries that had not been densely settled yet, like Jolie de Laubinière, because Laubinière is a, not a particularly arable, it's a rather swampy, low-lying land. A lot of it's not arable. So he used it, uh, he was a, a logger, a, he had a lumber business. And most of their profits come from logging their land, not from the rents that they get from their uh, tenants, let's call them. Um, and uh, they were able to completely control that land. It probably wouldn't have been granted a lot of it anyway because it wasn't very arable. But uh, the fact that it's now completely under their control I think it made it easier for them, let's say, to uh, raise money from a bank because I found when looking at his bank, at his lumber business, he had to uh, raise capital every year in order to pay the men who were working in the woods in order to pay all his expenses and then he would hope to sell and make a profit in the, the, in the spring. Um, or most of the, mil the logs were sawed during the early summer. Um, so, 
to, uh, and, and another interesting thing about Jolie de Laubinière is he was a Protestant, uh, unheard of in many ways to be a, a French-speaking politician and a Protestant, but his father was from France and a Protestant. He ran for election in his, in, in his county uh, many, through many elections and always won. Um, and, very, uh, and even became premier uh, for a short time. And I think that's because of his status as a senior. People still saw him as having some kind of prestige uh, and some kind of what I call noblesse oblige, right? He was the father of the people and he would, you know, do them favors and so on. So that mindset, that kind of old mind, paternalistic mindset does not just, it's not like the revolution in France where you're going to behead the seniors or anything. It's, it's a much more gradual shift. Uh, so 1854, there's a, uh, a young historian at the University of Sherbrooke, Benoit Grenier, who's doing a very detailed work on this now, but he's the first person to actually look at what is, after all, a pivotal event in, in Quebec history. You know, the, the, the abolition or commutation of the seniorial system. Nobody had looked at that before, except m to, m to my study on a very local level, on, you know, one seniory. But uh, he finds much the same thing, right? In fact, the elements of the seniorial system persisted into the 1950s. People were still paying rents until finally the Duplessis government in the 1950s uh, pays it off. Um, and um, that's the last vestige of it. So one of the reasons the seniorial system has not been studied very much is it really wasn't a revolutionary change in some respects. Um, so that makes it interesting in itself, I think. And why wasn't it? And that's the sort of thing I was kind of interested in looking at. And I think partly it's because the, uh, the legislation uh, was quite favorable to the seniors. They were indemnified for the loss of their feudal rights. And plus, um, they were con able to continue to collect rents. Um, and, uh, and so in Jolie's case, he amassed a lot of capital, couldn't build a new sawmill. Uh, it was very profitable for him. Plus, he continues to have the status of a senior uh, in people's minds. He was called a senior, as many people were, even though technically there was no seniorial system anymore.